The Beverly Hillbillies is a classic television series that started in 1962. It's about a poor family from the mountains who moved to a fancy neighborhood in Beverly Hills after striking oil and becoming rich. The show is full of laughs as the family tries to fit in with their wealthy neighbors, but it also has its share of surprises and touching moments. Now, I'd like to ask you, do you remember a time when this show brought joy into your life? Or maybe it even inspired you in some way. We're eager to hear about your favorite moments or how the Beverly Hillbillies touched your life. Please share your stories and memories in the comments below. We can't wait to read them. The Beverly Hillbillies, a television series that started in 1962, quickly became a favorite among viewers for its humorous take on a rural family moving to a wealthy neighborhood. People loved the show for its comedy and the way it flipped the rags to Rich's tail on its head. It was a big hit and stayed popular for many years. The show's success led to the creation of related products like toys and games showing just how much it was a part of popular culture. It also inspired other TV shows and movies that wanted to capture some of its magic. The Beverly Hillbillies didn't just make people laugh, it also made a lasting mark on television by showing that stories about simple, kind-hearted folks could win over audiences everywhere. In the early 1960s, a television show captured the attention of viewers with its unique blend of comedy and family dynamics. The central figure, played by Buddy Ebsen, was a patriarch who led his family from rural poverty to the wealth of California after striking oil. The show cleverly integrated its sponsors into its opening credits, with the family driving past billboards advertising products like Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Winston Cigarettes, seamlessly weaving in the slogans of the time. The backstory of the characters was rooted in the Ozarks, with specific references to their origins and family history, including the matriarch's Tennessee heritage. This narrative setup provided a rich backdrop for the humorous contrast between their simple country ways and the upscale Beverly Hills lifestyle. At its highest level, but understand the significance of these words as I say. Buddy Ebsen became a household name in 1962, joining a group of esteemed actors leading their own television shows. His show quickly gained popularity, becoming a favorite among audiences. Irene Ryan, known for her role in the same show, left a legacy that continues to support aspiring actors through a scholarship in her name. This scholarship is awarded yearly, recognizing talent in college theater. Joy Lansing's early life was marked by her parents' strong religious beliefs and a family change when her mother remarried, leading to her adoption by her stepfather. These individuals' lives and careers intertwined to contribute to a show that has left a lasting impression on television history. That's right, Uncle Jed. She's just sitting on the back porch in her rocker, and she says that's as close to California as you're going to get her. In a twist of events, the actual residence used as the backdrop for the show became a tourist hotspot leading to a ban on filming its exterior after the address was inadvertently disclosed. Meanwhile, Buddy Epson, at 54 years old, embarked on his television journey with this series. B. Benaderet, initially considered for the role of Granny, played a pivotal role in casting Irene Ryan for the part, recognizing her as the ideal fit. This decision came about despite Benaderet's own interest in the role and the creator's preference for her talents. I'd say, hi, Ma. When did you learn how to drive a car? <laughs> Transitioning from monochrome to a spectrum of colors, the show marked a significant shift on September 15, 1965, with its first episode in color. This change heralded the color era until the show concluded in 1971, totaling 274 episodes, with the initial 106 in black and white, and the latter 168 in color. The narrative took viewers to the roots of Granny's character, revealing her origins in the hills of Tennessee, specifically Napoleon, Tennessee. This backdrop set the stage for a comedic twist, as it was disclosed that Mr. Drysdale's family hailed from the same town, and a historical feud between his maternal family, the Bodkins and Granny's clan, the Moses family, was humorously explored. Off screen, the spirit of camaraderie was strong, with Donna Douglas and Irene Ryan hosting grand Christmas celebrations for the cast and crew fostering a sense of family and togetherness during the show's production.
than them slick hair, shiny shoes, sweet smelling city dudes. <laughs> Talking plum silly. You gonna Donna Douglas showcased her vocal talent as a gospel singer and ventured into writing with her book Miss Donna's Mulberry Acres Farm in 2011. That same year, she entered legal disputes with Maddell over the unauthorized use of her likeness for a Barbie doll, which was later settled. Previously, she had taken legal action against Disney and others alleging that the concept for the film Sister Act was improperly derived from a book she claimed to have rights to, but the court ruled against her. A piece of television history, the 1921 Oldsmobile Model 46 truck, which featured prominently in the show, now resides at the Ralph Foster Museum at the College of the Ozarks, serving as a tangible link to the past. The show also created a fictional bank, setting it on the real and bustling Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles, blending fiction with the city's actual geography. Miss Standish is only one woman, and probably the world's greatest authority on colonial... In the heart of Los Angeles, California, at 750 Bel Air Drive, stood a mansion that once featured a swimming pool to its back right. However, the pool and its adjacent area have since been completely removed. Richard Deacon, a notable actor, was cremated at Grandview Crematory, with arrangements handled by a funeral director from Westwood Village Mortuary. Meanwhile, Joy Lansing, a talented actress of her time, was in the running for the character Venus DeMarco in the film The Ice House, released in 1969. Despite her potential for the role, it ultimately went to another actress, Sabrina. Lord, but if you want to court me proper, you can come into the parlor. Uncle Dan, look here. In the world of early 1960s television, a unique form of comedy emerged, one that brought a rural family's antics into millions of living rooms. Among the memorable moments, actress Irene Ryan, who played a feisty matriarch, expressed her delight in scenes requiring her to discipline her on-screen nephew with a good-natured hit, which she delivered with gusto. The wealth of the family patriarch Jed was a significant plot point, illustrating the vast cultural divide between their simple country ways and the upscale Beverly Hills community. His 25 million fortune in 1962 would equate to over 217 million today, highlighting the show's ongoing theme of wealth and its impact. A notable real-life intersection occurred with actress Sharon Tate, who briefly appeared in the show. The tragic events at her later residence, 10,050 Silo Drive, cast a shadow over its history. The site has since been transformed, with the original structure replaced by a new mansion, which struggled to find a buyer despite its reduced price and infamous past. The Drysdale's been complaining too. Calls the police most every day. In the heart of Los Angeles, the grand residence known as the Clampett Mansion, which featured in the show, was not just a set, but a real house located at 750 Belair Drive, belonging to the Kirkaby family. Away from the screen, Max Bear Jr., who was well known for his role, sought to distance himself from the hillbilly image by taking on the character of Max Culpepper, a crime fighter in the pilot, The Asphalt Cowboy, though it never made it to series production. Meanwhile, Frank Cady, another familiar face, was poised for a comeback in Orson Welles' film The Cradle Will Rock in 1984. However, the project's delay and Welles' subsequent passing meant the film never came to fruition. In the backdrop of American television in the early 1960s, a show emerged that was backed by the serial giant Kellogg's of Battle Creek. It featured Max Bear Jr. as a key character who, despite missing from the final episodes, retained his place in the opening credits. Bear Jr., known for his infectious grin, landed the role of Jethro almost by chance, having auditioned on a whim without any expectations of success. Meanwhile, Buddy Epson, who was initially considered for the role of Davy Crockett by Walt Disney, found a silver lining after missing out on the part. His subsequent casting as Crockett's companion, George Russell, marked a turning point in his career, leading to his later role as the beloved Jed Clampett. This series of events highlights the unpredictable nature of casting in Hollywood and the serendipitous turns that can define an actor's career path. This is it. Tonight's kind of special, so I'm waiting. In the early 1960s, a classic television show brought together a unique ensemble of actors, each with their own personal histories and connections. Sharon Tate, known for her later work in film, was born to Paul James Tate and Doris Gwendolyn Willett, who united in marriage in the early 1940s. B. Benaderet, a familiar voice on radio and face on television, 
faced personal tragedy when her second husband, Jean Toombley, passed away shortly after her own death. Buddy Epson, a versatile performer, shared a bond with the Bear family, having known Max Bear Sr. since the 1930s. This friendship extended to Max Bear Jr., whom Epson mentored and later worked with as his on-screen nephew, showcasing a dynamic that resonated with audiences everywhere. Anyhow, maybe I ain't gonna like it either. In the show, the character Jane Hathaway was known for her distinctive choice of cars, favoring the Dodge brand. She started with a Dodge Coronet and later switched to a Dodge Challenger in 1970, both models being red convertibles. Phil Silvers, a notable figure in entertainment, is chronicled in the Scribner Encyclopedia of American Lives, specifically in the first volume covering the years 1981-1985. Buddy Epson, another prominent actor from the show, established the Beverly Hills Coin Club alongside Chris Oval, who was an emerging actor at the time. Well, I just had a call from Brewster and Tulsa. The Clampets are on their way home. Jethro? Oh, I mean the Clampets. <laughs> in his early career, Buddy Epson showcased his acting skills in Pittsburgh, taking the stage in productions like Whoopi and The Male Animal. His personal life was just as eventful. During World War II service, he met Nancy Walcott. Their marriage lasted four decades until 1985. Meanwhile, a subtle nod to Sharon Tate appears in the Woodstock film, where a newsstand headline in the background speaks volumes about the era's events, capturing a moment in history just as the festival did for music and culture. These targets. The object of the game is to hit them as they fly through the air. Ah, I reckon I'd like to try that. Give me a gun, Jethro. Sharon Tate, known for her role in Eye of the Devil, received high praise from co-stars David Niven and Deborah Carr for her acting skills, with both seeing great potential in her future. Donna Douglas, another talented cast member, showcased a unique skill on the show a loud attention-grabbing whistle. A humorous touch to the show was added with Granny's character, who would amusingly peek through the rolling letters in the closing credits, adding a playful end to each episode. In the landscape of classic television, a show emerged where a simple twist of fate propelled a mountain family into the high society of Beverly Hills. Among the characters was the affluent Margaret Drysdale, whose father, Lowell Farquhar, stood as a testament to the family's established wealth. Meanwhile, Shug Fisher and his musical group, the Sons of the Pioneers, left their mark on entertainment history with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for recording, a recognition of their musical impact. On screen, Donna Douglas portrayed Ellie Mae Clampett, a character 17 years her junior, showcasing the actress's range and the show's playful defiance of time. Douglas was 30 years old when the show began and had matured to 38 by its conclusion, yet her portrayal remained timeless. Jed, did you hear that? I sure did, Pearl. Mr. Jones? In the early days of television, music and casting decisions were pivotal to a show's atmosphere and success. Perry Botkin Sr. brought a familiar sound to the small screen, repurposing his musical scores from the film Murder by contract to enhance the scenes of a popular sitcom. Meanwhile, Donna Douglas, chosen from a pool of 200 to portray the beloved Ellie Mae, faced a setback with a neck injury just as filming was set to commence. Her recovery was vital, delaying production, a testament to her importance to the series. In a similar vein, Irene Ryan's portrayal of Daisy Moses became a recurring presence across multiple shows, creating a unique continuity in television history. Her character bridged different worlds, appearing in crossover episodes, and expanding the narrative universe shared by these programs. These creative choices and events shaped the legacy of a show that remains a cultural reference point. Lots of trees and fine hotels and swimming pools. We got a pond for swimming right here. Ellie. Donna Douglas, known for her role in a classic television comedy, later embraced a career in gospel music and became a successful real estate agent in Beverly Hills. The show initially had a different title in its debut episode, which was later changed from the second episode onward, along with the introduction of a new theme song, The Ballad of Jed Clampett, replacing Banjo Signal. The original pilot title and theme song are rare finds, preserved only in the complete first season's official release. In the storyline, Ellie Mae's romantic escapades with the fictional Dash Riprock parodied the trend of creating glamorous yet vacuous male characters, a concept that resonated with audiences and became a humorous reference point for similar characters in popular culture. 
Jethro, another character, humorously adopted the moniker Beef Jerky in a nod to this trend. Anything I can do, sir? Pray, Marie. Pray. <laughs> Before her role as the beloved granny, Irene Ryan had a successful radio career, notably co-starring on NBC Radio's The Bob Hope Show from 1948 to 1950 on the show that brought the Clampett family to life. Buddy Epson portrayed Jed Clampett, a character crafted to embody wisdom through simple, yet profound insights. His frequent resolve to have a long talk with Jethro became a recurring phrase, highlighting the contrast between Jed's grounded knowledge and Jethro's lack of common sense. Max Bear Jr., known for his role as Jethro, found leisure in playing tennis at the Kirkaby Mansion's courts, a luxury when the cameras stopped rolling. These elements combined to create a show that resonated with audiences, offering humor and relatable wisdom through its characters' antics and interactions. Buddy Epson's talent as a dancer was not just a trait of his characters, it was a skill he possessed in real life, showcased in the shows he starred in. His role as the head of the Clampett family came after a potential retirement, swayed by the compelling script he received. The show had a unique sign-off tradition in its later seasons, with Donna Douglas's voice thanking viewers and inviting them back, setting a familiar and comforting weekly closing ritual. All right. <laughs> Was it just a dreadful experience, darling? In the landscape of television, certain actors leave a lasting impression through their journey from a show's beginning to its conclusion. Linda Henning stands out as one such actor, having the unique distinction of appearing in both the first and last episodes of the series Sliders. Her presence bookended the show, marking a consistent thread throughout its five-year run. Buddy Ebsen, known for his role as Jed Clampett, brought humor and nostalgia to audiences with a special appearance in a film adaptation of the series. His cameo connected the past with the present as he appeared alongside Jim Varney, who took on the role of Jed Clampett. While Epson stepped into the shoes of another character, he famously portrayed Barnaby Jones. Laurie Saunders, another familiar face from the show, has since dedicated her life to philanthropy and advocacy. Residing in Montecito, California with her husband Bernard Sandler, Saunders is a mother and grandmother who actively supports causes like Feed the Children and Animal Rights, demonstrating that her impact extends far beyond the screen. You can't talk to Mom on that thing. Well, look who's getting too smart for his britches. Too big for him, too. Mr. This classic show left its mark on television history and continued to influence other shows and actors. It was referenced in an episode of Green Acres, specifically Lisa Has a Calf. Laurie Saunders, known for her role in the series, was later featured in the 2016 book Ex-Child Stars Where Are They Now? by Kathy Garber and Fred Asher. The talented Irene Ryan, another member of the cast, went on to perform as Birth in the Broadway production of Pippin directed by Bob Foss. Tragically, her life was cut short when she passed away on April 26 after being diagnosed with a brain tumor following a medical emergency on stage in March 1973. Yeast extract, antibiotics, 